I'd like you to turn in your Bibles to Genesis chapter number 1. In the book of Genesis chapter number 1, we began our series in Sunday school uh, entitled Biblical Manhood, A Call to Embrace God's Design. We looked in our Sunday school hour at the cultural war that is being uh, waged against the concept of biblical manhood. And we have feminized our culture. We have feminized our worship to the point that we are not at all fulfilling that which God has called us to do. We have uh, adult males who are regarded as men, yet still function as boys. <laughs> and it's a problem. And uh, it's one thing to have fun. Uh, but it is entirely another matter to ignore the responsibilities that come with manhood, to uh, ignore the um, order that ought to come with manhood, and instead to still function as a, as a boy who's playing video games still and he's 60 years old. There's a problem with this. Uh, there's a culture that, that we have created today. We talked a lot about that in Sunday school. I don't want to rehearse all of that. Uh, I am greatly bothered, and we read a very lengthy excerpt on how our worship has been feminized, and uh, it's tragic that this is where we are. I want to look this morning at um, a world to rule, and we talked about a cultural war in Sunday school. We want to talk about a world to rule uh, this morning. I want to mention one thing, though, and, and that I had already mentioned in Sunday school that I want to just reiterate again, because there are certain things that, um, you know, we tend to measure things, I think, off in the wrong way. Uh, manhood and masculinity, as we already saw in Sunday school, there's not going to be a, a slide for this right now, but there, it's not something that is measured physically. In other words, we're not saying that a, a biblical man is someone who is just ripped physically, uh, that has got this physique that is unlike any other. That's not the definition of a man. That does help, but uh, nonetheless, that certainly is not, uh, uh, is not going to be the, the definition of a man. Uh, we also are going to say, however, that biblical manhood is not egotistical and arrogant. There are a lot of people who are very egotistical in how they go about things. And as I said in Sunday school, I'll say it again, they're jerks to deal with. Uh, their opinion is the only one that matters. The way that they conduct themselves is filled with pride. God never once condones this concept of pride. And it ought not characterize us as men. It ought not characterize our leadership. We're going to talk about a domain to rule, a world to rule, so to speak. But this is not what we're talking about. We're not talking about someone who comes along and is a third thing that we saw as someone who's tyrannical. In other words, they ignore everyone else's input and, and it's just my way or the highway. Um, we do take the stand on what is right and what is wrong, but we cannot come into this concept of, uh, of manhood and of leading. Fourthly, we observe that it was not something that is unsympathetic. Uh, it's okay for a man to shed a tear, okay? We're not saying that he can, is to be completely emotionless. Now, he may not be one who is given to that. He may be one who does uh, bow more than that. But here's one of the biggest concepts, and this is what we already discussed, is the basis on which decisions are made. We make decisions oftentimes now based on how it might make someone else feel. In doing so, we have set aside what is right and wrong. We have set aside truth and error, and we have just simply said, well, this is what I think, but, but what do you think? We have made decisions that are more defined by what people may regard us as. Stop to think if many of the prophets in the Old Testament made decisions this way. What would their message have actually been? What would Moses have said to Pharaoh when he appeared before him? Moses said, comes and says to Pharaoh, Pharaoh, I'd really like for you to consider something. I, I know that this, this may not really sit well with you, but would there be any possibility that you would remotely consider just, you know, kind of letting Israel go a little bit, maybe? That wasn't how Moses approached Pharaoh, was it? Moses approached him with a confidence because that was what God instructed him to do. Hey, Pharaoh, 
God said this, let my people go. That's not a weak male. We have created a culture that is contrary to the concept of biblical manhood, and that's what we want to challenge today. Many of you today grew up playing games such as King of the Hill. I'm not sure if that game would even be allowed in our culture today. We played it all the time growing up. Typically, we played it on a snowbank, but not always. The higher the snowbank, the better the game. Because the object of the game was for you to get to the top of your hill and fight off anybody who attempted to take your place on top of that hill. The reason the higher snowbank was always better was because it made for a better fall for the one trying to conquer your hill. I played king of the hill on snowbanks. I played it on grassy mounds. I played it on just little elevated surfaces, whatever it was. I'm king of this hill. And then all of our friends would, would try to, to say, no, you're not. I'm going to be king of this hill. And, and this was just simply how we functioned. We, we would not allow any, nobody's going to take my spot at that top of that hill. I got snowballs. I've got ice balls if necessary. I'm going to be the king of this hill. The idea behind it is this. I'm going to exercise dominion over this. I'm going to rule over this hill. We can look at that as a rather simp simple and even shallow illustration of man's concept. But I want you to see what God's design is for man today. The design of God, it's stated in Genesis chapter 1 with all of the creation and everything that goes on. Verse number 26, and God said, let us make man in our image. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that concept, the concept of us. We'll deal with this in our series in Genesis here in, in a very short few weeks to come. Us suggests that of the Trinity, make man in our image. Man is tripartite. They're made up of three parts. After our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. I want you to begin by understanding God's design. And in order to do this, we go back to this time when God first created man before sin ever entered the world. And this is what is stated. Man had the responsibility, according to God, to have dominion over the fish of the sea, the fowl of the air, the cattle, of, uh, over all of the earth, over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. The word dominion suggests that man had a responsibility to rule or to govern. This is God's design for man. It's his natural disposition. I'm not saying that a female is never to occupy a leadership role of any degree. Uh, that's not at all what I'm saying. What I am saying is a man's natural disposition is that of ruling and governing. I did not go outside one day walking beside a snowbank, and my dad say, okay, here, son, I want you to go up on top of that. And I'm going to teach you this game called King of the Hill. There was just something about it that was natural. I'm going to rule this snowbank, and my friends weren't big enough to change it. My friends said, they're going to rule this snowbank, and I wasn't big enough to change it. And we battled and fought, and hell, oh, man, it was lots of fun. It's great. Nobody instructed us how to play that game. It was a natural disposition that we had that we were naturally put into this kind of capacity. God has created man with this natural disposition. It is natural for a man to assume a leadership position. That's the way God intended it. It is not natural for a man to have assumed no leadership and be run over by everybody. Again, we're not going to an arrogant and egotistical type of leadership. But nonetheless, that role of leadership is there. It is one that has been designed by God. 
Secondly, I want you to not only understand God's design, but I also want you to embrace God's design. We talked about this idea of dominion over all of these things. Adam was to rule over those things. Let me use a little bit of a different phrase and suggest that God has given each one of us a sphere of influence. We might call that sphere of influence the domain over which God expects us to rule. Adam was given dominion over the fish of the sea and the fowl of the air and so forth. But I want you to see that God has placed us into these various spheres of influence. We can get caught up on this concept that I have the right to occupy this domain. That's not it. But God has placed you in a sphere of influence. And you are responsible for how you influence that sphere. Joseph, we can turn to the end of Genesis in Genesis chapter number 50. Joseph went through a lot of difficult circumstances. Joseph could have very easily gotten bitter. All throughout these concepts or all throughout this area where uh, Joseph was challenged, and, and you can look at it throughout his entire life, Joseph constantly exercised godliness in whatever sphere God placed him in. Do you remember when Joseph was first imprisoned and then he was sent on to Potiphar's house? The Bible teaches that Joseph ruled Potiphar's house. In fact, he ruled it to the point where everything that Joseph had, or I'm sorry, everything that Potiphar had was under Joseph's management. It was under his control. To the point that he even managed his bank account. Joseph exercised this degree of dominion. All of a sudden, things changed. After the false accusation by Potiphar's wife, Joseph found himself imprisoned. We might say it this way, Joseph's sphere of influence suddenly changed. Joseph, at one point in time, managed all of this in Potiphar's house. And now all of a sudden, he was a prisoner. But it wasn't long before the keeper of the prisoner put him in charge of other prisoners. His sphere of influence changed. But look at how he ruled in that sphere of influence. Years passed. He was able to interpret a dream, hoping that he would be able to be released, yet he ended up being forgotten. Pharaoh eventually had a rather strange dream that Joseph ended up interpreting. As a result of that, Joseph's sphere of influence suddenly changed again. To use the word dominion or to use the word domain would capture still the same concept as he went and now assumed a different role of leadership. At one point in time, he was over Potiphar's house. That changed. At another point in time, he was over the prisoners. That changed. Now he was over the entire land of Egypt, third in command, as the Bible teaches us. Throughout each one of those situations, Joseph never once became bitter. Joseph did not begin to question everything that God was doing. Joseph did not allow the adversity that he faced to change who he was as a man. Joseph instead continued to exercise godly dominion. We're going to use that concept today. Don't let that concept ruffle your feathers too much, though as I said in Sunday school, sometimes our feathers need to get ruffled a little bit because it challenges how we think. It does us well to look and see what is the dominion in which God has placed us. How do we function in that capacity?
Joseph recognized God's hand in all of this. As his brothers have now known who he was, Joseph's now moved his family uh, to the land of Goshen. His father has passed away and his brothers immediately get concerned over how Joseph is going to treat them. Now that dad's dead, maybe Joseph's going to get even with us was how they began to reason. In Genesis chapter number 50, I want you to notice Joseph's perspective on all of this. But as for you, ye thought evil against me. But God meant it unto good, to bring to pass as it is this day, to save much people alive. Joseph went ahead and understood and embraced God's design for him. This was the sphere of influence suddenly that Joseph was placed into and he chose to function in a manner that was pleasing to the Lord. He chose to embrace this concept as though this was what God wanted him to do and he led accordingly. I want you not only to understand God's design, but I also want you to learn to embrace God's design. You see, the various spheres of influence which we have are all going to be distinct. The area over which you might rule is distinct. Yet, it is one that God has placed you in. Most likely, the spheres of influence that we might have are not grandiose, <laughs> More than likely, they're rather common. God desires that you rule that well. The domain in which God has placed you. This is achieved by determining to glorify God in whatever capacity he's placed you in. Amen. Let me challenge you men specifically today. If that capacity is working in assembly line, then you rule that domain in such a manner that God's work is furthered by your leadership. If it is working on a construction job, in a ditch, in a factory, at home, wherever it is, rule that domain in a manner that God's work ends up being furthered. We have created a culture that is contrary to much of what I'm stating today. Again, we are not I am not advocating an arrogant leadership. I am not advocating a dictatorship. I am not advocating this idea that men are to rule and women just walk around barefoot all their lives. That's not a biblical concept of any of this. But I do say this, and will stand by this, God has placed men in leadership positions. God expects you as a man to lead in a manner that is pleasing to him. That is established throughout scripture. The question that each one of us has to evaluate is how well are we leading in that capacity. We'll examine that topic more tonight when we'll look at uh, the Pharisees. Uh, they had a lot of ideas of what man's supposed to do and had a lot of commands and a lot of instructions. Were they good leaders? Uh, you'd be a fool to answer that question, yes, okay? Uh, they certainly were not, but yet they would fit the bill in far too many cases today. Not only do we want to understand the design of God, which is to rule that domain in which God has placed us, but I also want us to see the achievement of God's design. In other words, how do we do it? How do we reach the point where we are able to exercise a godly dominion? How do we reach the point where uh, we're able to rule things in a godly manner? It's There are many individuals who may exercise a sense of dominion. But that may be very far from godly. You may work with a boss who exercises dominion. He'll tell you in a heartbeat that it's his way or the highway. Is that a godly way? No. Is that what God expects us to do? No. 
Does a godly style of leadership ignore the opinions of others? No. Let me challenge you men, what if that opinion is from a female? You better be careful. Because sometimes we have the idea, well, yeah, that's just from a female. What value is that? Might be one of the best ideas you've ever heard. You're crazy in a leadership position to ignore those inputs and ignore those opinions. What if an idea comes to you as a dad from a child? Couldn't possibly happen, right? It can. But in our male ego, we have a tendency to take a biblical concept of dominion and expand it to an unbiblical concept that says, yeah, well, that means I'm just to rule over my wife. That means she's going to sit in the back seat of my car, talk when spoken to. Okay, yeah, good luck with that concept. I know some who've tried that didn't work out so well. Well, you know what? This is my home. If I want the thermostat adjusted, I'll adjust it, and you don't touch it till I come home. There are men who've had this mentality. This did not survive. It's not going to work. Well, I tell you, yeah, you're just going to do what I tell you to do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's arrogance. That's not the biblical concept of exercising godly dominion. That is not God's design, and it is not what ought to characterize us as leaders. Having said that, how do we achieve God's design? Number one, we have to submit ourselves to the person of God. We have to place ourselves under who God is as a person. We stated in Genesis chapter 1 that God created man. God said, uh, let us make man in our image. God is the creator, man is the creature. God is the one who designed you. Keep the perspective proper. When you realize that God is the creator, then what we are saying is God exists in a realm that is over all. Men, you may be placed in a sphere of influence, but you are not the one in charge of this universe. The world is not going to revolve around your opinion and your ideas of things. God is creator, and therefore God exists over all. When we realize this, we also say that God is sovereign. In other words, God has the right to do as he pleases. Now, let's look at a couple of passages. Isaiah chapter number 46. Remember, he says, the former things of old, for I am God, and there is none else. I am God, and there is none like me. Declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times, the things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. Do you think God has the right to do as he pleases? Amen. Yes. Psalm chapter 115, verse 3, But our God is in the heavens. He hath done whatsoever he hath pleased. Psalm 33, by the word of the Lord were the heavens made, and all the hosts of them by the breath of his mouth. He gathereth the waters of the sea together as in heap. He layeth up the depth in storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. Job chapter 42, then Job answered the Lord and said, I know that thou canst do everything and that no thought can be withholden from thee. Who is he that hideth counsel without knowledge? Therefore have I uttered that I understood not things too wonderful for me, which I knew not. You, God, says Job, can do everything. God is great. God exists in a realm that is far superior to that of creation. But what I want you to see is that although God is sovereign, God exercises patience and goodness to his creation. 
His rule is not characterized by an authoritarian dictatorship in which he lords over us. But instead, he exercises patience and goodness. Notice Psalm chapter 103, verse number 10. He hath not dealt with us after our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. For as the heaven is high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward them that fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. Like as a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pitieth them that fear him. Notice verse 14, for he knoweth our frame, he remembereth that we are dust. God is sovereign. And God balances that sovereign position perfectly in the manner in which he treats those who are under him. There are a lot of men who view leadership from the standpoint that I'm the guy in charge, I can do whatever I want. Now, you could argue that point and say, I can do whatever I want. You can do whatever you want to do. I would not recommend a lot of things, however. Okay? Do you possess the ability to do whatever you want to do? You could argue it. You might say, well, it's limited, whatever. Okay? But let's, for sake of argument, say, okay, well, I can do whatever I want to do. If I want to go buy this, I'm just going to go. And I want to go buy a brand new $80,000 boat, then guess what? I'm going to go buy a brand new $80,000 boat and I'm going to pull it home and I'm going to say, woman, that's what I am. I'm the man of this home. Now, there's going to be some problems. A lot of problems. The payment schedule is one. <laughs> okay. Now, There are lots of issues that are are going to come as a result of that. But let me ask you this. Am I treating those who are under me with consideration as to how now all of a sudden this is going to strap everything financially to the point that it's impossible? (laughs) Okay. There's strapping and there's, I don't know, I guess strangulating. That would probably be what that would be. Uh, that That would be far beyond just strapping ourselves by financial debt. My point is this. God has the right to do as he pleases. He's sovereign. But he exercises compassion towards those whom he is over. Biblical leadership men recognize who God is, and then seeks to balance the greatness of this position with patience and goodness to those whom he leads. That's a biblical man. He recognizes how someone perhaps can be addressed. I have three girls, obviously. They're all different. And I thank God for each one of them. But I can't handle each one of them the same way. They don't all respond that way. Every now and again, I forget that. (laughs) I take the tough guy approach. And the, you know what, fine. You want to do this? Fine. Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't work out so well. What I find is there are a lot of hurt feelings and a lot of crushing, really, that takes place. I'm not a perfect dad. I love my girls to death. In fact, I wouldn't be the dad I am without them. (laughs) Some of you will catch that. But anyway, um, you you look at at what, how we balance these things. Men, if we want to achieve God's design of exercising a godly dominion, then we have to strive to balance this as God balances it. Our authority with how we treat those who are under us. That eliminates the harshness. It eliminates the indifference. It eliminates the idea that my wife's opinion is irrelevant. 
Now, I may go against her opinion if what I feel is truly right. That is what it is. That's my prerogative as the man of the home. And guess what? I'm not going to answer to her for it. I'm going to answer to the Lord for that. So I better be awfully sure that what I'm about to do is, in fact, God's will. Okay? And when it comes down to it, that's the decision that has to be made. Now, when you rule in a right way, good things happen. 2 Samuel chapter 23 phrases it this way. He that ruleth over men must be just, ruling in the fear of God. And he shall be as the light of the morning when the sun riseth, even a morning without clouds, as the tender grass springeth out of the earth by clear shining after rain. This person's leadership in 2 Samuel 23 will be welcomed. It will be such that will be accepted. It will accomplish what it is attending to accomplish when it is done in the right way. Men, you want to exercise godly dominion, start by realizing your place under the person of God. Secondly, it also requires submission to the plan of God. In order for man to lead in a manner that exercises godly dominion, he has to align himself with the plan of God. God's plan, ultimately, is to redeem mankind from sin. That includes redemption, sanctification, and ultimately glorification. He saves you, he is sanctifying you, and he will one day glorify you. This is God's plan. If you want to lead in a manner then that is going to honor the Lord, you place yourself in line naturally with what it is that God is doing. Matthew chapter 28 gives us the Great Commission. Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. The word power in verse 18 is the word understood as authority. Jesus Christ has been given the commission by God, the authority by God, to give this commission to his disciples, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you alway, even unto the end of the world. The essence of the great commission is God's redemptive plan for all mankind. Far too often, we want to emphasize the word go to illustrate our responsibility to the lost. But what I want you to understand is that that responsibility extends far beyond telling the lost of salvation. The essence of the Great Commission is seen in the word teach, and it means to make disciples of all nations. In other words, our efforts ought to be trying to produce committed followers of Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, you are engaged in that commission when you are engaged in any aspect of it. So consider then the dominion over which God has placed you. Don't question it. Don't argue with God about it. Don't fret over what you can't do. Recognize where God has placed you and function in that capacity. So strive to reach the lost whom God has placed in your life. Strive to encourage and lead the believers whom God has placed in your life. Men, that might be your family. That might be these, uh, the young people within this church. These are the spheres of influence that we've got. Men, it is time to rise up to this challenge and determine we are going to lead in a godly manner. Set aside the hypocrisy that so often characterizes leadership. Set aside those areas in our lives that are not pleasing to the Lord and strive to get engaged in God's plan. And in doing so, what we'll find is we will be committed towards making committed disciples of Jesus Christ. That's the whole idea behind parenting. <laughs> what do I want my child to do? Honor the Lord. So then I'd better rule my domain in a manner that is pleasing to the Lord by placing myself under his person and placing myself under his plan so that I am ultimately accomplishing that which God would have me to accomplish. 
And when my children are doing things that are contrary to God's will and God's word, I have the responsibility to address that matter. It may not make them feel good. I may not get the dad of the year award, but it is best. One of the best analogies I just read recently of parenting is that of a uh, an individual who works in a greenhouse. And I thought through that analogy, you know, and, and I thought with my garden, you know when there are, are bugs eating the plants, we put stuff out to avoid that? Because we realize that, you know what, this is not helpful to the plant and the well-being of the plant. It's amazing what bugs come out on green bean plants, for crying out loud. Okay? Well, it's not healthy to that plant to allow that to go unchecked. It's not healthy to the plants over whom God has placed you to allow things that are eating them away to go unchecked and unchallenged. But we don't want to hurt their feelings. We're not saying that you go in and be a jerk about it. What I am saying is you've got the responsibility to lead in a manner that says, hey, you need to look at this part of your life because this is not right. Dad, I know what I'm doing. Dad, I can manage it. I'm 16 going on 40. Oh, I chose Rebecca's age because she's 16. Beck, that wasn't intentional. It was just a random number. <laughs> I was going to say, I don't know what I am. Uh, I'm 19 going on 40. There, I don't know. None of my kids are that, okay? The point is, look, we see these things. This is the responsibility of the leadership. A third thing I want you to see, and we have to do so quickly, is to submit yourself to the resources of God. Man, we're engaged in a great task of functioning, exercising godly rule over the domain in which God's placed us. It is one that requires tremendous resources. If you want to lead in a manner that displays God, you're going to quickly find out that it can't be fulfilled on your own strength. It can't be done on your own wisdom. It can only be done by dependence upon God's strength and upon God's resources. Second Corinthians chapter number 12. He said unto me, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Look, the, the beauty of this passage is not the infirmities. The beauty of this passage is the power of Christ. Amen. The beauty of this passage is not weakness. It's his strength being made perfect. And therefore I take pleasure in infirmities and reproaches and necessities and persecutions and distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. I am weak when I am dependent upon God. Amen. That's the time when I'm strong. Philippians chapter 4 verse 13. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. If we attempt to lead biblically without relying upon God and his strength in our efforts will be met with frustration and failure we will find that the task is overwhelming and impossible. Relying on our own strength and wisdom will be impossible. But when we tap into God's limitless resources, we can accomplish things far beyond what we would have ever imagined. Men, if you are too busy to make the sacrifices to know God with a passion, you are too busy. You can't lead this way that we're talking about today. You're going to have to get into the Word of God. You're going to have to know it. You're going to have to develop a relationship with the Lord that's not haphazard. Because if it is, you're going to find your leadership is going to be very sporadic. You're going to have moments where it's good and moments where it's terrible. A Christian who grows consistently in his walk with the Lord, that's the one who makes an impact for the Lord. My burden for this ministry is that the men of this ministry learn to lead in a manner that is biblically defined and not culturally defined. We have created an, uh, an equality across the board. And, and it's not to say that people are, are not important and all of that, but we've done this to an unbiblical concept. God's created man with certain things. It's the natural desire for man to do certain things. But we've got to temper that and we've got to lead in a manner that's going to be pleasing to the Lord. It's not just enough to say, well, we're, we're men, therefore we're leaders. It doesn't work that way. We are men, therefore we need to be godly leaders. 
Because this is the way that God's placed us. And so now begin to look at the spheres of influence that you've been placed in. Joseph's changed frequently. Ladies, some of you have been placed in spheres of influence where you are in a position of authority. This is nothing against you. Today's Father's Day. This day is against the men, okay? Uh, you get to sit back and take it easy, all right? So don't get your uh, hair all bent out of shape over this. That's not what we're talking about. The point of it is this. You've been given these spheres of influence. So be godly in them. Make a difference for the Lord. Don't just sit back and let life pass. Don't sit back and, and not be engaged in this ministry. Lead people in a manner that is going to be pleasing to the Lord. Exercise godly leadership. Value the opinions of others. Don't disregard someone's opinion because of their sex or because of their age. We can't function that way. But we have to function in a manner that is going to ultimately lead this congregation in a manner that will further God's kingdom. That's my desire for this work. And it's a challenge. It's a challenge for every single one of us to embrace. But it's one I believe that when we understand the various dominions over which God has placed us, that we rule those things well. That's the whole thrust of this message. Not to elevate man to a superior status, to challenge them to lead in a manner that is going to reflect Christ and that is going to further his work. And it's a challenge. The Pharisees had a lot of ideas about what should be done, but they didn't do it. They were hypocritical. We're going to focus on that aspect of this tonight. It's easy for me to go along and tell my children, you guys need to spend time with the Lord. But if I don't, isn't that hypocritical? See the problem? You need to watch what comes out of your mouth, I might say to my children, and they can turn right around and say, you need to watch what comes out of your mouth. There's a problem. Okay? It's inconsistency. And we need to shore up those things and we need to lead in a manner that is going to be honoring to the Lord.